Hi, I'm Polly Jean Harrison. I'm here at Money 2020 Las Vegas. Why don't you introduce yourself for us, please? Hey everyone, I'm Nate Sofio. I'm the founder and CEO of Portable. We are a self-sovereign identity provider specializing in bringing decentralized identity standards to mainstream financial services and allowing consumers of all type to take hold of their identity and reuse it on an as-needed basis across Web 2 and across Web 3. Fantas I'm really happy to be here. It's fantastic. It's so great to have you here. How are you finding the conference so far? I absolutely love it. Uh, I did Money 2020 last year, which was more like the, uh, the decaf version of Money 2020. <laughs> I think there's still a lot of like, rightfully justified um, COVID anxiety. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of that anxiety is shaken off. Obviously, the real world sits in a different place than I think the climate here. But I, it's safe to say that Money 2020 feels back to normal. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's very busy up there, like so busy. It's really co quite cool, actually, to see everyone all together. It is. So I really want to talk to you, obviously, about Portable and kind of what you're doing, because you're very, very new onto the scene. So <laughs> I'd just love to hear more about you and how you guys started it all. Just give us, give us the whole story. Yeah, of course. So the origin story kind of traces back to 2020. So a bit of a time hop. Um, I got the idea for Portable started March, April of 2020, after having spent 10 years already in, in FinTech and RegTech, mm -hmm. specifically anywhere identity intersects with financial access. So going a bit deeper, that means I was building, I was working with different types of startups, either in product management capacities or pre-sales engineering capacities around everything from anti-money laundering and SAR filing and data reconciliation to KYC and KYB, which is know your customer, know your business, respectively, to different types of fraud. And then understanding the data architecture, data security, data governance stuff, like all the like 99% invisible, like back office-y type of stuff that goes into sorting out good customers from bad, preventing systemic risk, and trying to smooth financial access. 10 years in that space is a lot of time in that space. Um, I'm very grateful to have built in the US, built stuff in Western Europe, built stuff in the UK, and really became very familiar with different types of regulatory regimes, data privacy laws, you know, everything from you know, Dodd-Frank and um, regs over here to GDPR over in Europe and kind of everything in between. Um, sometimes like very frustrating to build against, but also very, cha but very satisfying to get around some of those challenges. Mm -hmm. So that's the backdrop. But one of the things that always continued to bother me, and which is like the kind of core impetus for getting Portable started, came from the fact that you as a consumer, despite best efforts, you could have a great credit score, like perfect marks, you can't take data that's been verified by some provider or app or service with you to another app or service. So in essence, you're always starting from scratch. The app or provider is always starting from scratch to get to know you again. There's no trust from the get-go. It's a cold start problem, essentially. That's part one. Onboarding experiences are a pain in the neck. You have to fill out forms. You have to disclose data. You're coughing up personal information. And you have to do that every time you want an app or a service. That accumulates a lot. It's kind of irksome. It creates a lot of security vulnerability, privacy vulnerability you lose control of your data along the way. Having said that, the identity stuff doesn't stop at onboarding, and like I'll make that super clear. There's a whole life to your data after onboarding. And that typically involves a lot of headaches for providers on one end who have to spend a lot of time and effort, usually manual effort, to keep track of how a customer's data changes over time. And then the consumers, who now have data spread across in many places, have to go through the headache of maintaining that stuff. Stuff gets out of sync. You know, there's different versions of you essentially floating around. And so as a result, it's hard to have kind of consistent trust throughout the financial ecosystem. All of this drove me nuts. This kind of wash, rinse, repeat cycle of coughing up data. At best, it's inconvenient. At worst, it's outright exclusionary. Better financial identity, or the lack of better financial identity, contributes to things like onboarding abandonment rates um, and other kinds of process factors that lead to, or parts of the reason why we have financial exclusion. Financial exclusion is really complicated. Um, folks, there's different types of financial exclusion, whether you're thin file or no file. Um, 
whether you're an immigrant or, or not. Um, some of it breaks down along class and race lines for a lot of complex and kind of very frustrating <laughs> systemic issues. Um, but part of it is, OK, people should be able to create for themselves a trusted identity that they can bring with them. Mm -hmm. It backs into operational efficiencies for businesses. It backs into figuring out how to make finance more inclusive for individuals. And none of these problems were really being solved in a way such that a consumer could take his or her data back into their own hands, kind of keep that updated, keep it curated, and keep it synced to their accounts, whether it's on in the Web 2 world or Web 3 world, safely and securely and seamlessly. So I said, OK, if there's a way to reconcile this stuff, some of the operational stuff on the business end with consumers' needs to keep their data more like tightly curated and more close to the self, we can solve for a bunch of these things at once that stem from compliance and operational inefficiencies, onboarding attrition rates, and just consumer friction. So let's go out and solve a four-way where consumers can own a trusted version of their financial identity and use it across their apps and services. And so that's, that's the background for why it kind of came to a head for me in 2020. Uh, as you can imagine, this is very complicated for a lot of different reasons, technological, um, governmental, and policy reasons. Um, so I brought the idea with me to Wharton to do my MBA. Shout out to Wharton for being probably the best MBA on earth to do fintech. Mm -hmm. like, period, full stop. That is a hell I will die on. <laughs> but it was great because I was able to validate and invalidate a lot of stuff very quickly over those two years. Um, but I'll pause there. I can go more into you know, what I learned at Wharton and kind of how Portable came to be over those two years. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll pause there and see kind of what jumps out at you. And I mean, I there. mean, a lot of things jump out at me for, for starters. But I mean, just in general, so you, can, you have this idea. You go to Wharton. What happens next? How do you build that from just, oh, that would be a really cool thing to do, to here's a company that we've launched? Sure. So I would say first semester at Wharton, First of all, I'll say my entire first year at Wharton was very strange because mm -hmm. it was 2020, like peak pandemic. Everything was on Zoom. At once a blessing and a curse. So wasn't going into class, not meeting people in person, no random like run-ins and things like that. On the other hand, it was nice because you could have like accounting over here, watching on Zoom, and then like actually doing work on Portable on another monitor over here. A lot of trial and error, experimentation. Mm -hmm. Doing, going down countless rabbit holes around security, compliance, different types of protocols, what's going on with different types of public key encryption, other ways to like sign data to make it usable elsewhere, stuff like that. 2020 was a lear fundamentally a learning period. Mm -hmm. Things started to come to life in 2021. Uh, I had enough of a business plan and this notion of almost like a financial passport that people can use to you know, basically duck in and out of accounts. And I was very fortunate enough to meet the team at PairVC out in the Bay Area. Every year they do an MBA pitch competition. And what I was trying to do with Portable resonated with them. Some years ago, Pair was an investor in a company called Nova Credit, which now has like a rather big booth over, over to the back <laughs> right. Um, and the fundamental premise of Nova Credit is that you know, it's very hard to extend credit in the US to immigrants because they can't take their foreign credit scores with them. Mm -hmm. Foreign credit bureau data was not at the time interoperable or transplantable or movable to the US. No credit solved for that. Payer saw the value in that. And that kind of model clicked with Payer. They're kind of in a, the best possible place to say, oh, wait, you're going to do this with financial identity data within the US framework. It clicked for them. And so they were our first check. And so as a result, now, you know, now you've got some gas in the tank. Let's, let's sort this out. And so the summer of 21, I went to San Francisco and worked in Pear's Accelerator that summer. Uh, at that point, I met my founder, Alex. He was an engineer at Consensus for quite some time. And then at that point, he had been the CTO of an identity company in Europe that specialized in building identity standards across manufacturing, pharma, IoT, and financial services. He was getting a little itchy. He wanted to like really you know, um, dig into finance specific problems. So it was a very good fit kind of at, at first sight. Um, it was both dumb luck and good fortune that he and I met to begin with. And I think that's really where it started snowballing. Mm -hmm. 
we started putting the pieces together to, for how to get decentralized identity, sometimes called self-sovereign identity, to click for financial services. And it relies on kind of two mental models that are probably worth sharing. The first is called the trust triangle. So in, in self-sovereign identity, you have three types of agents. You have verifiers, issuers, and holders. The easy part is the holders. Holders are just consumers. You own your data, you possess it, whether it's non-custodial, which means it's like on your phone or something like that, or custodial, which means it's in the cloud through some provider. Whatever they're doing in their cloud architecture is what they're doing in their cloud architecture, and you can kind of call on the data as needed. So th those are, that's what's going on with holders. Holders are the consumers. Verifiers and issuers is where it gets interesting because we said, okay, if we can get financial service providers of all stripes to be verifiers and issuers, this means we can say, okay, someone with their home account, say it's like a Chase or Wells Fargo or Fifth Third or something, or a Chime, they can say, yes, back up my data, turn it into a credential, and that's called issuance. And that could be maybe 10 or 15 data points, something like that. They can say, this is now mine, and it's transferable. We're not removing the, the data from within Chase or from within Chime, but we're giving a consumer a usable, portable, excuse the pun, representation of it. So this person now can go to a Robin Hood or a SoFi or something else, and instead of having to cough up the data from scratch, they can, they'll see this button, connect with portable or sync with portable. And for anyone watching at home, you've probably used sign in with Google or sign in with Facebook. People love that kind of interaction. It's simple, it's easy, you know it works. Mm -hmm. So we said, OK, how do we do this, but with the fact that someone owns their data, and it's much more data than like a name and a password. And so this is where some of the back end stuff that we're building comes into play. We figured out the way um, to get that to happen very seamlessly without excess clicks, without passwords, things like that. Some of it relies on really fantastic open standards um, from the WC3 called verifiable credentials. Other standards we use are called decentralized identifiers. So some of that's on the back end that enables these very consumer friendly, very smooth transitions for permissioned or consent first data sharing. So if I have my data and I want to go open an account somewhere else and I see that button connect with portable, I click that, I prove I'm me either with you know, phone biometrics or like an OTP to my phone. And then it says, hey, Robinhood is asking for these 12 data points. Do you consent to share them? And that's a really big thing that I want to pull out here is what Alex and I knew from the get-go is that one-click KYC or one-click onboarding is almost too good to be true. Mm. It's, it's almost too abstracted away from making sure that a user is who they say they are at the time of sharing and that they can affirmatively consent to sharing things that they already possess because they're theirs. So, okay, do you consent to share these 12 data points with such and such provider? Yes, I do. Then a bunch of the other backend uh, technology we have in place kicks in where the data points are revalidated. It's pretty s straightforward. You know, it gives Robinhood, in this case, the chance to interact with a pre-trusted identity. If the data can be kind of confirmed against Robinhood's configuration for how they ask for it, welcome to Robinhood. And the kind of the core thing we solve for that then is, OK, this means we can allow an institution to onboard someone in two clicks in 15 seconds, when the industry best right now is like four and a half minutes. So it's like a dramatic change um, that we are excited about because we said, OK, we've now enabled people to basically bring their data all at once to the party instead of going through piecemeal steps. And it means they can use the pre-verified data again. It can be revalidated. And that revalidator, or the verifier in this case, also issues a credential. Mm. And then you as a consumer, you now have your Chase credential and your Robinhood credential. They're both yours. Your data has been kind of approved twice. So you're building a good data history, essentially. And this is kind of a key concept that we got very excited about around the end of 2021. It's, it's not just the fact that like the present state of someone's data can travel with them, but it's the good history of the data mm -hmm. as well. That's what makes it believable. That's what makes individuals trusted is you have the entire kind of lineage of the data with that person. So you know that, okay, this person has been verified before. 
I can see that it's a record of good verifications. Some of it is masked or obfuscated for privacy or compliance reasons, but it allows people to kind of have lasting trust in the system, not just kind of like a one-shot deal. So those were things we were very excited about. And then we realized after the holidays, okay, this, this works. We've done this in a way that doesn't violate regulations. It doesn't freak out like OCC or FinCEN. It doesn't break the Bank Secrecy Act. All right, we have a thing. We have a product. People are interested. Institutions are interested. The market's kind of not great. So we, said, we just pulled the trigger and said, let's raise two years of money as quickly as we can, start building a team. And so we did. And you know, very happy to say we basically closed up the round. Well, we literally closed the round the Friday before I graduated from, <laughs> from business school. So it was kind of a nice little mic drop, yeah. um, I will admit to, to saying that. Um, but we still kind of stayed fairly quiet, built through the rest of the summer, added on five more incredible teammates. And just last month, we announced in TechCrunch that we are live. We have a product for issuing identities that's embeddable inside existing fintechs and apps and providers. We raised you know, two and a half million dollars, led by Harlem Capital with Six Man Ventures and Bessemer participating along with Dorm Room Fund and Payer from before and Rough Draft Ventures. And so now we're, you know, now it's, now it's a real thing. You know, it was a weird kind of two years of incubation, experimentation, but when it clicked, it clicked. And then we just went for it. And now we're out here chatting with like large FinTech providers, banks, sponsor banks, and kind of everyone in between who are all really interested in understanding, okay, how do we get into the decentralized identity game? How do we do this in a way that is like simple and straightforward and intelligible to like the everyday user without you know, upending our existing user experiences and without necessarily upending our pre-existing KYC stack that we can see how it plays into that in the future. But for now, let's be an issuer. Let's get people started. Let's get people excited about this and allow them to, allow them to have their verified data follow them around, yeah. essentially, in ways that are encrypted and privacy preserving by default. It's all, it all sounds very exciting. I really love from listening to you then, the idea that you're kind of taking the ownership and giving it back to that consumer. Because I know there's a lot of stuff around data, mm -hmm. you know, people selling data, and, and, I, and the average consumer probably doesn't quite understand the whole situation. But the idea of giving them the, the security and knowing that their data is there, it's secure, and they can share it with whomever they want, you said consent. And I think that's, that's a really key thing here, which I, I really love. It's, it's something that is kind of core to how we think about the experiences. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think it's molded by the fact that the team comes from both Web 2 and Web 3. Mm -hmm. And we're both, we're all, I guess now seven of us, are intimately familiar with the fact that there's user experiences in both of those realms that are downright awful. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> if you're on the Web 2 side of things, it's having to fill in the same stuff over and over again, not knowing really where your data is being used or at worst resold, then you get spam and text and all sorts of stuff from like advertisers and data brokers and things like that. And then on the Web3 side, Web3 has a lot of user experience stuff it needs to hammer out across data security, transactions, making transactions secure. Part of it stems from a real heavy emphasis on anonymity, mm -hmm. which makes certain things kind of clunky um, there's other just tricky things from the Web3 world around wallets, tokens, exchanges that make that add extra steps based on just architectural decisions, encryption decisions, um, you know, on-chain decisions. We're starting to see some of that smooth out with like embedded payments and easier on and off ramps. But the point is, is the team's really dialed into all of the terrible <laughs> UX that exists. Um, that takes trust away from the experience right. and takes control away from the experience. And so as a result, we said, okay, we're building a company. What values do we actually care about here? And we saw how much is like painful and ugly across the web two and three divide. And we said, okay, let's build for stuff that is commensurate with the values that we want, which is simplicity, empathy, and craft. Really, if you kind of sat us down as a group, we would say, we want to be the most empathetic identity product company in the world. That's kind of our 
secondary mission, you know, apart from being able to create a universal financial identity for as many people as possible that is accepted in as many places as possible. Mm -hmm. But in order to do that, we could build the coolest technology in the world, but if it's not trustable, forget about it. Right. And so we have to commit ourselves to empathy and trust and craft to build good things for everyday people who might do their finances in Web 2 or Web 3, but most often it's kind of somewhere yeah. in the middle. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's so important. It's really nice to hear things coming out in that space. And I guess the, the kind of the last thing I want to know from you for now is what's next? So obviously I know you've only just launched. It's all very new. But what does, you know, what does the next year look like for you? Where, where are you headed? There's a lot on deck. Um, I wish I could share everything. Um, but the things I can talk about really are committing to the main thing we're trying to prove in the next six months is we want to be the ones who normalize the use of decentralized identifiers, or DIDs, and verifiable credentials, which is kind of the data modeling about how you structure identity, how you structure supporting evidence, stuff like that, and normalize that for financial services. There's a lot of other projects out in the world right now that use VCs and DIDs for various different purposes. There's a ton of like smart, opinionated people working on these through open source projects, public-private partnerships, um, private enterprise. It's super cool to see all of this happen. You know, um, I think for us, because of where we stand with our values and our commitment to creating products that work for the people and the institutions, the institutions and the millions of people who depend on them, for us, we want to normalize the approach and be the first provider out there to say, hey, we've just allowed someone to verify data over in their home bank and use it to open you know, a credit card or use it to open a investment app account or hey, use it to verify an address or do an age verification with say a cryptocurrency wallet or like an identity gated DAO or something like that. Those things are all on our kind of, you know, milestones for the next six months. But I think the ones that are particularly important to us are showing the reusability of verified data in traditional finance, which historically has been slow to move, but quick to recognize that open finance is a vital necessity. This is kind of where things get interesting, because open finance has come a long way. You know, you have PSD2 in Europe, you have a bunch of stuff around Dodd-Frank and other regs in the States. You know, some of it is around people being able to own their data a little bit more closely to the vest. And some of it is around making data interoperable. You know, Plaid, for instance, shout out to Plaid, has done an incredible job with allowing people to connect bank accounts to apps and allow certain types of account and identity data to move freely between those apps. Super awesome, and it has like set the precedent for like, well, here's how we get open banking and open finance started. But from our perspective, open finance can't achieve its full potential without self-sovereign or self-owned identity that people can take their identity with them on the go. And so for us, that's kind of our biggest milestone we could hope to achieve. Find the right early adopters in tradi more traditional banking, traditional finance, fintechs that deal more on the Web 2 side of things than on the Web 3 side of things, and prove that, and prove that someone can take their verified information in part or whole from place A and use it to successfully open an account in place B with something very particular, and that's called outcome-based equivalence. That's the biggest thing that we can prove right now, and prove it to the market, prove it to the CFPB, to regulators, to the rest of the industry, that someone can take their data that they may have happily verified or you know, re-verified over the years over here, and go share it in a privacy-preserving, consent-first way with two clicks, and get on with things. Mm. And that, for us, would be the biggest milestone we could possibly achieve over the next six months. Amazing. Well, it's been so great to hear more about Portable. So thank you so much for joining us yeah, today. Yeah, of course. Thanks so much. This was great.